the workshop agenda today, we're going to be start, starting with an introduction on developmental opportunities, followed by an in-depth look at cross-agency experiential programs. And then our next session will be on details and rotations, how to host and find these on USA Jobs Open Opportunities. After lunch, we're going to be looking at coaching and mentoring, how they differ, why they're valuable. And, and then uh, we're going to go into an in-depth panel discussion on mentoring programs and successful strategies for starting, sustaining, and evaluating mentoring programs. So um, I know there are some folks who were, look, were asking about questions on the earlier slides. Um, if you did not receive your uh, slide links early, I'll make sure everyone has the slides afterwards. And, and uh, just that's a great actually segue to, uh, into the next presentation. This presentation is going to be a, a very full presentation with a lot of slides. Everyone will receive the slides. You'll all have a chance to uh, review them after the presentation. So uh, some of these slides I'll go, I'll kind of glance over, but don't worry because you'll have all these slides um, for your own review later. So this first session again is about, uh, it's an introduction to developmental opportunities. We're gonna go into what they are, why they're valuable and how federal employees can host and receive them. So this is the agenda. We're gonna start off with what they are, go into the benefits of them, some mechanisms for how to host and receive developmental opportunities, talk about um, individual development plans, and then how do you request um, developmental opportunities, and then a summary at the end and, and time for questions. If there are questions, um, Monica Walford is going to be monitoring the chat, so um, Monica, if you can just let me know if there are any questions that pop up um, during the session, that would be great. So, um, so let's dive in. So what are developmental opportunities? So folks just wanted to um, put some things in the chat there to all panelists and presenters. What are developmental opportunities? What are some examples? Great, I'm seeing them pop in here. Fantastic. <laughs> so there's a lot, there's a lot of different options for developmental opportunities. So um, so there are opportunities to learn, to experience, and grow. Some examples, that, um, low, the easy ones that everyone will bring up are training, conferences, and assessments. Uh, also, I see coaching and mentoring up there, details, rotations, fellowships, internships. I saw shadowing. Informational interviewing is another one. Going on special assignments, joining working groups, volunteering. Um, joining employee groups, networking, joining professional societies and communities of practice. So great, a lot of you had pulled up a lot of these already. So Gabby, here's our next poll. So have you ever, so select all that apply, have you ever hosted a developmental opportunity or experienced uh, an opportunity of your own? So the poll is going to come up. So you, you can um, select all that you, that you've been involved in? Have you hosted a person of your own and, and shared an opportunity with them or have you experienced your own? And it looks like nearly everyone has experienced their own developmental opportunity and about half have hosted an opportunity for someone else. So that's fantastic. And Gabby, you can go ahead and end the polling. Great, so, so why are developmental opportunities important? So the benefits to the employee, they're, they're quite a few. So of course, there's learning involved, learning new skills and competencies, learning how other teams work, about the mission, management style, and culture of other agencies, about career paths. Um, you can prepare for advancement, network and connect, work through a hurdle. Also, there's improved morale, performance, flexibility, and adaptability. And simply time spent away from, from your usual responsibilities allows time to reflect and develop new perspectives and ideas. I see, uh, I see some folks saying that they didn't see the poll. Uh, not everyone can access the polls. You have to be in the app. If you can't access the app, then please do um, use the chat box to answer the poll questions that come up. So there's lots of benefits to the employee for developmental opportunities. This, this one in particular is this came from GovLoop. Uh, so benefits, to the supervisor, uh, supporting developmental opportunities can help develop staff, of course, including growing the next generation of leaders, adding new skills to the team, keeping skills up to speed, such as uh, new skills, like cyber, cybersecurity skills, skills 
adding diversity and new perspectives, facilitating innovation and a learning culture, achieving improved programmatic performance. When bringing in outside talent, the team also has additional support, potentially recruiting new staff. Um, but the organization as a, as a whole also benefits. So when, when agencies support development, some of these benefits include um, facilitating a learning culture and innovation, continuous improvement, developing new skills and competencies, adding diversity and perspectives. And also you see improvement and capability and skill sets, the ability to adapt to change and improvement in morale and engagement. Um, the score on um, the FEVS uh, Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey on the question, I am given a real opportunity to improve my skills in my organization. This is actually specifically listed in the, the FEVS um, Viewpoint Survey as well. Uh, it can help with recruitment, retention, succession planning, and overall performance and success. So what follows in this presentation, I see a question about what is GovLoop. It's um, a independent, I, I think a nonprofit organization. I can uh, send, the, send the, the link as well. They have lots of good re resources on, on their website as well. So examples of developmental opportunities, I'm gonna go through many different examples here. Again, you'll have the slides so that you'll be able to access the details later. So I'm going to kind of summarize them broadly. So I'm going to start off first with fellowships, internships, and training awards. So thank you for adding, Gabby added the GovLoop um, uh, URL in the, in the chat, so thanks so much. So fellowships, internships, and training awards, there are many, many opportunities for, for feds to bring in uh, folks through fellowships, internships, and training awards. There are ways to bring in current students, recent grads, and early to mid to late uh, career professionals and retirees. Many of these opportunities are geared at and aimed at people who are not currently federal employees, although there are some special federal employee focused programs as well. Most of these opportunities are full-time, some are, some are part-time though. Most benefits um, to the host or some of the benefits to the hosting agency include um, bringing in outside perspectives, special skills and support, increasing um, knowledge of federal career paths and a knowledge of the agency's mission and programs, uh, which can offer a potential path to recruitment, and also disseminating special training and skills. I noticed that there are um, some great lists of fellowships and internships. Um, here are some links to a few of them. And I've taken some of these and, and others, and, uh, and this follows in the list that I'm about to present. So one of the first that you'll notice, uh, which is on the OPM website, is the Pathways Program which contains uh, three different paths, an internship program, a recent grad program, and a program that I think a lot of you have heard about already, the Presidential Management Fellow or PMF program. So a bit about the Pathways program here, this is an internship program for current students, high school, college, trade school, or other qualifying institutions. So this can be part-time or, or full-time, so it's a broad range of, of uh, folks are able to apply for that kind of program recent grad program as well. These are usually a year and um, they're at various federal agencies. The PMF program, uh, that's a program where uh, the fellow comes in as a GS9 through 12 and uh, they're provided training and developmental assignments. So this program usually lasts about uh, two years. So again, you'll receive these slides and you'll get all of this information uh, for each of these. These fellowships, I do note um, some things such as how do you host a fellow, how do you get more information, what's the contact for it in the website, and, and where are the, the fellowships held, so where are you able to draw folks in so all agencies can host these fellows, so it's a great path for, for folks to bring in, um, bring in um, folks to support your, your initiatives. Some other internships um, that you'll see, Department of State has an internship program. Actually, they have a couple internship programs. Um, this one is a virtual program. Um, FAA has a minority serving in institutions intern program. There's a federal diversity internship initiative and a summer transportation internship for diverse groups. Uh, now I'm going to move into some examples that are skill focused. Um, they have a whole host of uh, fellowships and internships available out there and uh, with different skills. This one specifically um, looking at acquiring insight into the U.S. copyright system. Uh, there's some general ones out there like the Robinson Foundation for Government Fellowships. 
There are some that are geared at foreign affairs. So here's an example, the Thomas Pickering um, Foreign Affairs Fellowship Program. And I just noticed some question about slides. So slides will be available and the links should be in your, your registration email. So again, this, these slides will tell you how do you um, apply for these things? How do you host them? What's the, the, the website that you can go to for more information? Uh, this is another foreign affairs uh, fellowship that's also related to IT. And uh, now this next batch has a lot of uh, fellowships that are, again, related to IT, cybersecurity. So here's, here's one uh, where you can, there are lots of different agencies that participate in this, census, CIA, D DOD, DOE, HHS, DHS, state, et cetera. So lots of different folks can bring in talent this way through the cybersecurity talent initiative. Um, there's also the Office of Business Informatics Innovation Fellowship Program. And now the next fellowship examples here are focused on uh, uh, STEM type fellowships. So we see one here um, that there are here's an example of the AAAS uh, STPF fellowship, the American Institute of Physics uh, State, State Department Science Fellowship Program is one example of that fellowship. Um, DOE has another um, STEM fellowship here. And so I see, I see some other folks who are putting in, what about Department of Agriculture internships or fellowships for STEM students in college? So great. And actually, if you could please, um, if I'm uh, missing some fellowships here, I know there are many others out there. So please do, if you see some that I haven't uh, mentioned, please do put them in the chat box for all to see. So the Navy has another internship program. Uh, this one here is geared at a uh, survey methodology. This is another um, Department of Energy uh, fellowship. NASA has a postdoctoral program. Uh, there's an ORISE fellowship that's offered by uh, the Department of Energy. So some of these fellowships, they're, they're managed by a certain agency, but other agencies can actually enter into an interagency agreement with that agency to take advantage of that fellowship program as well. So even when you see a, a program that's managed by another agency, it might be possible to still use that mechanism to bring in fellows of your own into your program. And I see someone said that NOAA has a, a program, the C Grant program, so fantastic. There's just a whole host of ways to bring in folks into your programs and, and develop them and, and uh, help them understand more about the federal government, bring in new skills, et, et cetera. Uh, this is the Rose Education Award, another DOE uh, program, Science and Technology Policy Institute Fellowship. This is a USGS uh, fellowship program. Uh, this is a program, so this is another STEM program, uh, but this one is actually open to feds and non-feds. So this is one of the programs that's actually open to feds as well. This is a DOD program. Um, and then a, a lot of you have probably heard about the, the PIF program, the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. This one is open to everyone, but as a note, so this is also open to feds. Uh, this program, if you do join this program, it's not a rotation where you're temporarily going. You would be leaving your current position and going to this program. So this, this program is about one to two years and folks are hired in as a GS-15 step one and receive federal benefits. There are also a lot of public health fellowships where you can bring in fellows to work on public health topics. There's the Health and Aging Policy Fellows Program, uh, the IRTA Program and Intramural Research Training Award Program. A lot of information about that. There's all sorts of folks that you can hire from um, undergrad through uh, grad to, uh, to um, sorry, to pre-doctoral and post-doctoral programs. There's also an Academy Health Fellowship and a public health informatics fellowship program. This one is offered by the CDC. And like the ORISE fellowship program, other agencies can, can enter into interagency agreements with the CDC to bring in their own fellows into their programs. Uh, there's also a service fellow mechanism to bring in folks for public health related things. And, and I know folks, I'm going through this very quickly, but you all have the slides. I have a lot to get through um, for this presentation, but you all have the slides. so. So don't worry, uh, I'm just going to, uh, to go through this kind of breeze over them and introduce you to them so you can all see them on your own in the slides. 
So after seeing this huge breadth of opportunities that are available to bring uh, folks into your program through fellowships and internships and training awards, I just wanna see a view in the audience, how many of you became a federal employee after serving as an intern or a fellow? So just curious to see how many folks in the audience have became a federal employee after serving as an intern or fellow. And it looks like we have about 20%. So 20% of the folks out there. So, and I see more, um, more folks are putting in AmeriCorps and Army Logistics. So, um, so folks have asked for to drop a link of the, to the slides in the chat box. Um, so Monica, if you're able to copy the link to the slides, that would be great. So we will make sure that you, um, you get that. And that was in your registration information. Um, it came out in an email this morning at, at eight o'clock. Oh, there we go. There's the slides. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And again, you'll all, if you didn't get the, the link, we'll make sure that you, that you get the slides afterwards. So all that to say, there are lots of folks who are not only you're, you're spreading the word about federal and federal, sorry, excuse me, programs and pathways uh, about your mission, uh, you're bringing in talent and everything, but it's also offering a way to potentially uh, drive drive folks to um, to federal service and and uh, into federal positions. So there are programs that are geared at current federal employees as well. There's the Mike Mansfield Fellowship Program, which I think someone actually mentioned in the chat. And this program is geared at building a core of US government officials with substantial um, exper expertise about um, Japan. So it's a language program and it's a program where you travel to Japan and, and spend uh, in-depth time there, understanding their, their um, policy-making process and establishing relationships. So uh, just a little bit more information about this one. So you do receive a federal salary and allowances for living expenses in, in Japan. Uh, there are also the federal cross-agency experiential programs, and we're going to be going into depth about these four programs after this session. So there's the, the CXO, uh, Customer Experience uh, Fellowship Program, that uh, GS9 to GS13 folks are able to apply for. There's the President's Management Council Interagency Rotation Program, the PMC IRP program that GS 13 to 15 folks are able to apply for. There is the White House Leadership Development Program that is open to GS 15. And then there's also the SES or Senior Executive Service Candidate Development Program that is open to current feds and non-feds. And I see someone in the audience that's done the Mansfield uh, Fellowship and is willing to chat with anyone. So that's great. <laughs> So uh, the cross agency, are they typically all located in, in uh, DC? So, you know, it's a different world right now. That's one thing to mention with, with these fellowship programs is that some of them are on, have been on a bit of a hiatus uh, because of the pandemic. Some of them are, um, are coming back soon. Some of them have never stopped. They've continued being virtual. So I think they're, a lot of these are, are typically in DC, but, uh, We'll see what the future holds with the ability to continue with, with some of the virtual aspects. So now I'm going to go into some other types of developmental opportunities. So we started off with fellowships and internships. You can see there are a whole host of them. There are also uh, details and rotations, and we just mentioned one, the, the PMC rotation. So uh, details and rotations are temporary transfers from your position to a different position and the employee is generally expected to return to their home position at the end of the assignment. If it's a rotation that's specifically a federal employee um, rotating or detailing to another, another uh, group, then the eligibility requirements are that they are career or career conditional federal employees. There are some specific details and rotations that are also allowed for, uh, for non-feds as well. So eligibility includes um, meeting requirements for experience, getting supervisory approval, and of course, receiving acceptance by the host program. The schedule varies for details and rotations. Some of them are part-time that allows you to continue working in your current position. Some of them are, are full-time and requires the participant to leave their current 
position temporarily and uh, attain that other position that they're rotating to or detailing to. The cost also varies. So, and I see someone saying the PMC program is awesome. <laughs> I was in cohort 13. Uh, so, so the cost also varies as some, some programs are non-reimbursable. It means the participant's home agency continues to pay their salary and, and others are reimbursable where the host agency or the agency where the participant is going to for the rotation or the detail uh, covers the costs associated with the detail or rotation of that employee. So I, I see some folks talking about um, programs they've been in. So please let me know if you have any questions. I am monitoring the chat as I'm, as I'm presenting. So please let me know if you have any questions. So examples of rotation, I, I did mention the, the President's Management Council Interagency Rotation Program. That is an example of a, of a rotation program. These programs, the primary goal of rotations is uh, training and development. So develop the participant either within or outside their current area of expertise is to prepare them to be able to fill future agency needs and, and also increase their exposure to an understanding of other programs and agencies and departments. Secondarily, um, the goal is also to fulfill temporarily a need for the host program um, for a particular project or function or tasks. So it also increases collaboration across programs and agencies and departments. So again, rotations, the primary goal is for training and, and development of the participant. For details, the primary goal is to fill a temporary unmet need for the host program. So an example of a detail is uh, someone's, a regular employee is away and they're bringing a detailee in to help, or they're bringing a detailee in to help with a certain, um, when a certain skill is needed. So the secondary goal is to develop the, the detailee to focus on, um, on their exposure and understanding of other programs. And, and often skill development is still linked to, um, to this program as well. And it as will also increase collaboration and, and connection between different programs and agencies and departments. And there's someone in the audience that says, I am on a detail starting yesterday working with children on the borders and HHS. Um, and, and she's on a, a full-time detail. So there are different ways to operationalize uh, details and, and rotations. Uh, some of the forms that are used in these agreements, if there's no um, funds exchange, then sometimes folks use memorandums of understandings. If there, is, uh, if there are funds exchange with temporary assignments of federal employees, then uh, folks often use the, inter the interagency agreement form, the treasury interagency agreement form. Uh, there also, there's another mechanism called an Intergovernmental Personnel Act Mobility Program, and this uses a specific form called the, the 69 form. And I'm going to go into uh, a few uh, additional points about the IPA program. So this is a temporary assignment of personnel between the federal government and state and local governments, colleges and universities, and Indian tribal governments, federally funded research and development centers, and other eligible organizations. So it can help agencies uh, meet their needs and fill these hard to fill positions, such as it may be IT things or, or, uh, or nursing positions or um, specific uh, high level positions as well with a new skill. Uh, can serve as, these folks can serve as recruiters or ambassadors. It's beneficial to, to both agencies involved. Uh, again, uh, this one uses a form called the OF69 form, and it allows folks to be brought in for up to two years and a maximum of four years. It can be intermittent, part-time, or full-time. It can be um, reimbursable or not reimbursable. So this one varies. So I just wanted to provide a bit more information about IPAs here. Again, you'll have the slides to go into this in more detail on your own. Just want to stop there to see if anyone has any questions. So during a detail, are you responsible to complete any work related to your current position in addition to workload related to the detail position? So that depends, this is a great question, that depends on whether or not you're in a full-time detail or a part-time detail. So if you're in a full-time detail, you are temporarily leaving your current position and going to a full-time detail. Sometimes there are a few 
tasks that may linger on and that you're you're checking in on while you're in your your full-time detail but usually if you're in a full-time detail then you're temporarily pausing your work at your home agency uh, someone asked can you jump gs levels and uh, and details and i will actually leave that question to um to there's a presentation happening at 11 10 today that will go into more information about details and rotation. So we'll talk about them there. Do you have any tips on how we can broach the subject of development with supervisors? Great question. We will get to that later in the presentation. I'm going to move on now to mentoring and coaching. So what is the difference between mentor, mentors and coaches? So coaches ask probing questions to help the individual being coached find the answer on their own. They provide assistance and encouragement, and it's often short term, although sometimes not. Mentors, on the other time, are often more prescriptive. They offer advice, opinions, and direction. And mentorship, mentor relationships are often more uh, long term. There is a session on coaching and mentoring from 1230 to 120. So we're going to go into, into depth about how to become a coach and, uh, and more information about mentoring as well and successful strategies for both. And also there's a question here, how do you find mentors in the federal government outside of our agency? So that will be discussed during the, the coach and mentor um, session again at 1230 this afternoon. So tune, tune in for that as well. So the next topic I'm going to mention is connecting and networking. So one of the ways to, to connect and network is through shadowing. So simply sending an email to someone and saying that you'd like to shadow them. It's often to learn a new skill get hands-on experience or even try out a job and decide if it's a good fit and meet leaders in your field. So perhaps they're, they're running a policy-related meeting, uh, some activity that you'd like to see and experience on your own. So that's, that's shadowing as opposed to informational interviewing. It's another thing you can email someone and say you'd like to do an informational interview with them, ask some questions about how did they get where they are, uh, learn more about their field, their position, associated career paths, learn more about their agency, work-life balance, or culture. So I, I see user training um, for so questions about coaching, so we will be um, getting into that more later this afternoon. So shadowing and informational interviewing are two great ways to network and connect. So how do you connect and stay connected to others in your field? So uh, other ways, other ways are to join working groups. There's something happening in your agency. There's a particular project with a mission and a goal. Maybe they're they're looking into evaluating something and changing a policy. Uh, joining working groups is a great way to build skills and also meet meet other folks in your in your field. Um, join a professional society to connect with others and and learn from them in your community and within and outside the government. So after this. Uh, workshop today in about a month, I'm going to be sending out a, a resource document that includes a list of different professional societies. And I look forward to hearing if there are some that I've missed. I know there's a whole host of possible professional societies there, but I know that there are more, more available as well. Also joining a community of practice. So communities of practice, um, if you join their email list, then it helps you connect with others in your community, stay informed, also be able to ask questions. How do you do this? How did you do this in your agency? Um, what's worked for you? So help learn from others, um, share lessons learned and successful strategies as well. So in uh, that document that I mentioned, I'll also be sharing uh, a more detailed list of, of many communities of practice. And Gabby put in the great shout out to the Digital Gov communities of practice and the link there to the page of the many different Digital Gov communities which includes this, uh, this community, the uh, Federal Leadership and Professional Development Summer Series community. So here is a link uh, or, or a list of some of the lists of federal communities of practice. So uh, again, we have the Digital Gov link on the top that lists a bunch of different communities associated with Digital Gov. We also have um, other lists of, of communities listed here. And, and again, I'll, I'll also provide a more detailed list in the document that I'll share um, you'll all receive it as participants to receive it in about, about a month. And so someone asked, where can I learn more about that opportunity? Uh, I think there are folks that are communicating about 
photo coaching program. So that's, that's great. Love to see the chat going on. So other benefits to connecting and networking, uh, discover similarities um, and differences outside of your home group and increase productivity by learning from others, learning new approaches and skills and not reinventing the wheel. Also potentially striking up new collaborations, working together to go further faster as the, um, the slogan for the, the series says. So other ways to do it, we've mentioned a few. Other ways are attending training, meeting the people that, that are attending training with you, attending professional conferences and meetings. Uh, again, we talked about work groups. So, so leading cross-agency efforts or, or joining employee groups. Again, mentioned joining professional societies and communities of practice, going on a detail or rotation. You'll meet a host of folks doing that. Um, mentioned shadowing and informational interviewing. Join a LinkedIn group. Uh, join a max.gov community. And I know this is a bit antiquated, but you can also carry business cards. So that may be something of the past, but it still might be useful sometimes. Um, and also after you've made connections, follow up and keep in touch. So I just wanna stop there for a second, pause if anyone has any questions. Someone mentioned the federal executive board um, programs, uh, each of the different federal executive board boards have a lot of different training opportunities. So they're, they're also a wonderful thing to be connected to. So other opportunities, we have, of course, attending trainings and reading various, uh, various books and, and things that journal articles that are helpful to your field. In that post-seminar handout that I mentioned that you'll all receive in about a month, that also has a huge list of, of training options and, and reading, a reading list as well. You can attend professional conferences, uh, attain uh, federal certification. So there's a list here, a link to a list of several different government related certifications. You can volunteer in service groups, organize your own effort, and also apply for short term opportunities and a mechanism um, called USA Jobs uh, Open Opportunities. And I'm seeing some folks raise their hand if you could please um, chat in the chat box any questions that you have. So any questions that you have, please, um, and rather than raising your hand, please type the, your question in the box. Is there a place for a list of all meetup activities? So meetups are a great place to network as well. And uh, so there are lists of different uh, meetup activities. I, I think that LinkedIn is a, is a great way to link to some of them, but I'll, I'll turn it over to folks in the audience to see if you have other, other um, ideas as well. Uh, one person asked, how has the pandemic affected these programs, such as uh, details and rotations offered remotely? So that's a great question. And, and uh, I did mention that some of these programs, like the fellowship programs and the internship programs, some of them have been affected. Uh, the programs that were in person, uh, some of them are now operating remotely. And there are a few that have paused for the past year and, and are starting again um, this summer or may still be on pause. But a lot of them still continued on uh, virtually. Okay, so, so you have all of these opportunities out there. Uh, I've mentioned a whole host of, of developmental opportunities. How do you know what would be most beneficial for you? How do you, it's, it's a, when you start to think about it, there are just so many options out there. Where do you start? So one option is to do some, some self-assessments and try to help identify in, in better detail what your strengths are, where your opportunities for growth are. Uh, maybe even information about your personality type and leadership style and, and your abilities, such as your emotional IQ, to learn a, a little bit more about your strengths and, and where your opportunities lie. So there are lots of different assessments out there. And as a disclaimer, I'm going to mention a few that are some um, frequently used assessments, but I'm not endorsing any of these uh, assessments. Just some options out there that I know a lot of, of folks have used. So. Um, Assessments can help inform individuals where they might want to focus their, their training and maybe where um, what types of work environments and jobs they might fit best in and other areas where they might be a bit challenging for them. Uh, it can also help with agencies with succession planning and team building and uh, help improve communication and conflict management, um, help improve relationships and, and productivity as well. 
So uh, assessments just broadly are in kind of two types. One is a single source where there's just information coming from one source, usually self-assessments or interviews. Uh, Multi-source assessments combine self-assessment information with feedback for others from others. So for example, from your supervisor or from the people that you're managing. I'm going to go through a few uh, different types of assessments here. And I know that, um, that we don't have enough time to really dive deeply into all of them. But again, you'll have the slides and links to get more information if you'd like. So 360 assessments um, collects feedback from yourself, but then also from other individuals. Uh, again, it could be supervisors, peers, or subordinates. It can identify working in leadership styles and traits, leadership strengths, uh, development needs, and, and how, how you rate yourself compared to how other folks rate you. It uh, helps or it aims to inform uh, your training plans, your career decisions, and, and also succession plans. The DISC is another assessment device uh, that is used. It's DISC stands for Dominance, Influence, Steadiness, and Conscientiousness. So it's based on a five-point scale and folks rate themselves um, on different behavioral tendencies ranging from I strongly agree to strongly um, disagree. So some sample questions are, I would rather work on a team than work independently. Getting results is one of my top priorities, or I am very team focused. So it goes through a whole host of, of questions and folks rate themselves on a one to five scale. So this helps to identify working leadership and man management styles, traits, preferences, and behavioral tendencies. Uh, it helps identify the relationship and leadership strengths and um, developmental needs and how one rates themselves again um, compared to how invited folks rate them. There is a version of the DISC that actually does allow for outside comments as well. So it aims to inform an individual's understanding of their own behaviors, communication needs, and priorities. So another assessment test that, uh, that most folks are aware of is the Myers-Briggs personality test. It's an online assessment with basic preferences and the questions are targeting extroversion versus introversion, sensing versus intuition, thinking versus feeling, and judging versus perceiving. So it's one of 16 personality types that are identified and it aims to improve an individual's understanding of their own personality type as well as understanding other personality types as well. And it may also help inform one which positions and work environments may be the best fit. Another uh, single source example is the uh, TKI assessment. So this assessment has about 30 questions, it's an online self-assessment, and it helps identify one's ability to handle conflict. And it looks at uh, each of the five methods of handling conflict, competing, collaborating, compromising, avoiding, and accommodating. And the aim is to improve an individual's understanding of, of their tendencies when dealing with conflict. Another assessment is called the Thyro B. Uh, this one is a 54 item online assessment that measures interpersonal needs. So it, it identifies needs for inclusion, control, and affection. Um, needs for receiving, how others um, treat you, and needs for expressing. And it, the aim is to improve understanding and awareness of how you tend to treat others, how you want to be treated, uh, how your behavioral tendencies uh, will not always meet others' needs, and also looks into a bit with emotional intelligence. Clifton Strengths is another one that a lot of folks have used. Uh, this one has 177 pairs of self-descriptors, such as I read instructions carefully versus I like to jump right into things. Uh, individuals choose the option that, that fits best with them and to what extent. They have 20 seconds per pair and it's a five point rating scale. This test aims to identify their top five strengths and ideas for short and long-term actions based on their top strengths. The aim is to improve the individual's understanding of their own strengths. This here is a list of uh, several lists of assessments and also a list of, of other online assessments um, based on the, the target for the assessment. So I'm gonna pause here real quick to see if anyone has any questions or comments. Um, so someone asked, are these assessments free? So the ones starting emotional IQ and going down, those are free assessments. The ones on top are just lists of assessments. 
and uh, one person saying that they found the Clifton Strengths valuable. And, uh, and I have heard that some folks have used um, the Clifton Strengths for their teams as well. So uh, folks are asking about, can you get information from the chat? I will collect information from the chat and share it with the attendees as well. So links people are putting in and things like that. I will share that with folks. You can also copy and paste uh, what's in the chat as well for, your, for yourself if you'd like. So now you figured out kind of what your needs are, what your direction is, and how do you organize it all? One way of doing this is an individual development plan. So the general process is that the employee and the supervisor can consider the employee's strengths, weaknesses, and goals, as well as organizational needs and requirements. Uh, the employee and the supervisor meet to discuss and they develop it together. And the employee carries out the plan, <clears throat> but the, the supervisor is there to support as well. So some of the common elements are their, their name, position, agency, job series, grade, their short and long-term career goals, including target dates, short and long-term training and development objectives, including dates. And then of course your, uh, your signature is at the bottom. So uh, what an IDP is, is employee supervisor partnership involving preparation and feedback over time. And it's a tool to track employee professional development plans and goals. What it is not, it is not a performance appraisal tool and it's not a single time event. So the, some of the benefits are both parties take time to consider the employee's strengths and opportunities for growth. For growth. The employees clearly communicate their professional goals to their supervisors. Uh, employees and supervisors work together to plan training and developmental opportunities. Employees take responsibility and initiative. Supervisors commit to providing support and goals are identified, plans are developed, and progress is tracked. So someone mentioned earlier, how do you request developmental opportunities? There are opportunities that you've heard today that you think uh, that would really uh, help with your development, things that you're very interested in for your career path. How do you request them? How do you ask your supervisor for things like this? Are there any hurdles that might come in your way? So there are some potential supervisor concerns. So some supervisors um, may have hesitation regarding granting developmental requests because of concern that the employee may leave after the activity concludes. So they may go to a new job. They may like it so much they leave. So that is a concern and, and that some supervisors have and it may cause them to hesitate. But I want to follow this with professional development is, is valued by employees. So 76% of employees are looking for career growth opportunities. 74% of employees don't believe they're reaching their full potential. So one risk of not supporting developmental opportunities is that employees may end up leaving anyway because of the lack of support for growth. Morale, engagement, satisfaction, and ultimately retention can be impacted by development. So, as a reminder, along with general development, leadership is part of every role and position, and consequently, leadership development can be useful at all levels. So I, I know sometimes folks um, have an issue requesting leadership development approval if they're not currently in a position that is specifically a leadership position, but leadership is part of every role and can be beneficial to one's productivity and success at every role. So tips for making developmental requests. So a, a few here. Uh, one is to outline benefits of the developmental opportunity for yourself. How will it affect your team and your agency? Think about your agency's mission, your team's mission. Tie it to your current role or your future capacity. So regarding leadership development requests, uh, just a note, just tying back to what I just said, leadership is part of every role. A path to leadership experience can include something as simple as creating opportunities wherever you can, such as leading a team meeting. So there's leadership that can be really involved in anything. So, and, and just see how do you um, compete with your peers when, uh, who are also trying to apply for leadership development opportunities that are limited in slots? So that's a great question. When 
there's an opportunity that that is very limited. Maybe that only 10 people or 15 people are selected. So there are opportunities you've heard of today that are very selective, um, such as the White House Leadership Development Program. You'll be hearing about that more in the next session. So there are some opportunities that are, that are very selective. There's some opportunities that may be very expensive to attend. So there are some things that I think are, are harder to ask for, but I, I do want to say that there are lots of opportunities out there that are free and lots of opportunities out there that, that are easier to fit into your schedule. And one of the things we're gonna be talking about more um, during the, the later uh, detail and rotation session at 1110 is USA Jobs Open Opportunities. So that's a way that you can look at what are the opportunities out there right now for um, coming in and doing a short part-time, uh, short-term project that is a, a simple rotation to another group and, and back again. And it could be something that's just a couple hours a week or a couple hours a month even. <laughs> so there are ways that you can fit in experiential activities like that Asking for a coach or a mentor, again, uh, thinking about, you know, what activities do you, do you want to do? What is your career goal? Uh, finding those people and directly contacting them and asking them, can they, uh, can they meet with you? And can you do an inter inter sorry, informational interview with them? Get some more information about how they got where they are. What do they recommend? Uh, just doing that connects you to that person. Also, you know, if they if you meet with them and they have time for also doing a shadowing opportunity, that's another way. So one person saying, my experience is that when I volunteered to lead in one position, I was given other more impactful leadership opportunities. It was noticed. So, um, so, so yes, there are lots of ways that you can uh, you can do things on your own to to make the case uh, for, for activities. And, and also to, um, for example, the, the training that I'll be sharing and the, the reading list, there are things that you can do on your own that you have more control over. It's true, there are some, some opportunities that are more limited either by the number of people who can be selected or by uh, the cost, um, but there are lots of ways that, um, that you can actually still uh, be developed. So, Moving on here. So the summary of what we've gone over today, and I've left some time here at the end so we can have some discussion and perhaps even a small break before, <laughs> before our next meeting. Uh, but we talked about training and certification. So there's lots of different training out there. I do have a whole um, list of some, some common uh, training sources used by the federal government that I will share with folks. Uh, there are different certifications that you can get, such as uh, project management, uh, PMP. There are other things that you can do uh, to build up your, your, your skills and your, your skill set. So again, assessments, uh, assessments that can help you find where your strengths are, uh, what your interests are, what your leadership styles are, maybe um, hearing from your peers and learning a bit about yourself, learning where your opportunities for development are, um, being able to, um, to pinpoint things that would be of most value and most meaningful to your development. Uh, attaining a coach, um, even, even a coach that's just a, a short-term um, coach, and again, we'll go into coaching and mentoring more uh, later. So that session's at 12.30 this afternoon. So attaining a, a coach to help you think through things and uh, attaining a mentor to, uh, as more of an advisor. If you have a hurdle that you're trying to get through and a, a question you really need someone with expertise to help you through and a, a mentor can, can help you with that. Uh, a mentor can be uh, gained simply by, when I talked about informational interviewing and shadowing, you can ask a request to meet with someone for an informational interview. And if you hit it off and you have a, a great connection with that person, you can ask them, would you be willing to mentor me? So uh, mentors come out of all places. So just looking at the Army Command is currently working on implementing a developmental assignment rotation or a de developmental assignment program. So any suggestions on how we can jumpstart the program? So um, that's a great a great question. 
Uh, so we're going to be talking more uh, in the, the last session of the day about mentoring programs and how to start them. So developmental assignment programs, I think uh, one of the things that you need for starting a program like that is making sure you have folks who are willing to host assignments. So, so advertising and getting interest. So the, the first part is, is getting, getting folks aware of the opportunity and getting interest in it. So you have folks to, to offer opportunities for people to come in and, and rotate to them. And, and that you have uh, folks who are aware of the opportunities and so you have a cadre of, of folks who are going to be able to apply. So the first thing I think is announcements and, uh, and also buy-in. So what is the purpose of the program? What are the goals? Uh, what, what are your, um, your hopes for, for, for accomplishing uh, for each of the, the folks who are actually rotating in and, and, and being assigned to different groups? So uh, I would say starting, starting with a, a programmatic performance plan, knowing what your goals are, and, and really uh, having full announcements and, and publicity around, around the, the program so that, that folks are aware of the opportunities. So just looking at some of the chats that are coming in, talking about learning being continuous. So uh, that's one thing that I mentioned earlier is benefit for the organization that's, that's actually uh, setting up programs like the one we just talked about that the Army is setting up, it creates a learning culture. Uh, so, and, and folks that are interested in continuous improvement and continuous learning and adapting. One thing um, with all of these things we've talked about today, it's not a one-time thing. So you may uh, take some courses, go on a rotation, take an assessment, but it's a continuous process. So just to always uh, check in again and see where are you now? Where would you like to be? And, and what will get you there. So just going back to some of the some of the other things we went over today, details and rotations. Again, details are usually focused on uh, the project that you're doing and rotations are focused on um, primarily on your own development, but there's secondarily there's a project as, as well. Uh, but details are also, you know, just by doing the detail you are being developed and you're learning more about another agency and another, uh, how another team works, how another agency is, what their culture is like. So they're both great learning opportunities. We talked about fellowships and internships and, um, and also training awards. And, uh, and someone just asked, um, will you be covering where to find details and rotations later today? So that's a great point. <laughs> so finding details and rotations and finding fellowships and, and internships and things like that. Uh, they can be hard to find. A lot of uh, details are listed on, uh, on USA Jobs Open Opportunities, and we're going to be going into more detail um, during that 1110 uh, session today. So some things are on USA Jobs uh, directly uh, for, for fellowships and details. Uh, some rotations, you're really going through your, um, your training Council at your agency, your chief learning officer. So, so folks who are sharing the opportunities with you, uh, it's contacting your own agency. Um, and someone said you can create a detail too. That's a good point. When uh, you see something you're really interested in, you know someone has a need, you could approach them and, and talk about um, what are ways you might be able to help them especially through something like uh, using USA Jobs Open Opportunities with something more uh, short-term and, and part-time, you can work something out to, to have a partnership and, and detail to that group. I'm just reading some of the, the, uh, the chat in. Uh, So when will the video for this event be available? Um, the videos will be posted in about a month. So, uh, so where can I find opportunities such as volunteer opportunities and things like that? Uh, I, I would, would say some of those things, it's really Google. Honestly, a lot of how I found the list of internships and fellowships was Googling. And I have to say, it's not easy to find some of these. I, I will be sharing all of all of what I have put together today and, and more in a, a resource document that I'll share with everyone to try to help um, you have one spot where you can find a lot of these things. And, and I look forward to hearing um, 
other folks, I know there are things that I, I didn't mention because I'm unaware of, of certain opportunities. So I'm, I look forward to seeing all the, the other ones and I will add those to the list as well. So please do add them to the chat and, uh, and also add them to, um, you'll, you'll have a survey after the, the workshop today. And there's a question in there where you have the opportunity to, to also uh, suggest other developmental opportunities that you're, that you're aware of. So uh, just going on um, to, we talked a lot about uh, USA Jobs Open Opportunities Experiences. We talked about um, the value of connecting with others in your, in your community. Uh, and, and folks usually have many different communities. So uh, you may be someone who's involved in, in health policy, but also in statistics and, and, um, and maybe, um, there's, there's a, another employee group that you're involved with as well that connects with, with others um, and you're uh, that's connected to, to, to you in, in some way. There are different um, groups such as actually the, the group that's um, supporting today's event is Arc Magic. So there are lots of different employee groups that you can join and it's a way of, of learning from others, seeing what others are doing and, and also learning about events and opportunities and, and things that we're talking about today. So how can you find volunteer opportunities and, and things like that? Joining these groups is definitely one way to be connected to your, to your people and your, your group to, to learn about things like that. So another thing is to join working groups. So if there's something going on where your agency or program or, or, or group is trying to address something. So say uh, the FEVS survey came out and there's an issue that they'd like to address, uh, volunteering for things that you're interested in, being part of these working groups, developing your skill and, and working on whatever the, the, uh, the group may have as their mission, but also uh, meeting and being better connected to all the people who are in that working group. And then also I mentioned the individual development plans and really having uh, having something written down for yourself and, and your supervisor to know what are your goals and what are your career goals um, over time? Where would you like to be? What, uh, what is something that uh, is really driving you and how are you going to get there? And uh, in all the opportunities we talked about today, some of them are free, some of them don't take much time. Um, others take more time and, and need more planning for us. So just Having a smattering of all kinds of options is a good way to do it, and and there are are ways you can um, you can just uh, one person said you can also start a working group about an issue. So if you you see something, you notice something that you'd like to uh, address, improve, uh, etc., then talking to your supervisor and talking about well, I'd like to to work on this problem, and I have some. Um, some colleagues I know that are also interested in this. So taking initiative and, and trying to start one on your own. So just pausing here um, to see if anyone has any questions. So we went through a lot of information and we, we ended with, um, with six minutes to spare. So, so I appreciate your attention and all of your great uh, questions and comments and your engagement. I noticed too that a lot of folks have connected with each other and noted when they've been in programs that we've talked about. And, and so uh, it's fantastic that you're all sharing and, and connecting now as well. Uh, one person noted that IDPs are also a great way for managers to assess what training um, is needed for their team. And if there are commonalities and budget for these opportunities, that's a fantastic thing to note. So if there's a training that you would like to uh, attend and you know that others are, are interested in the same topic, then it might be possible to have an instructor speak to your entire uh, group. And, and then more people can be developed at the same time and, and probably in a more cost-effective way. One person asks, are individual development plans mandatory? No, they are not mandatory. They're just nice to have. So nice to help with your development and, and mapping out uh, your, your progress and your plan. Uh, so just looking, uh, looking to the different um, questions here and 
So folks are asking some questions about credential standards for GS series. Like I think um, every group has different, every uh, job series has different credentials. And one person had a comment, things are going by very quickly. Um, one person said having an IDP helps obtain funding in our organization. I think maybe they're, they're talking about uh, funding for training perhaps. Sorry, some things are going by very quickly. <laughs> so lots of comments. Um, so just see, and, and Monica and Siobhan, if you're on the line and, and have any things that have come up and you want to voice them, let me know. Uh, folks mentioned a dedicated training office and um, a lot of agencies have training offices and you can speak with them to see what options are available and, uh, and, and what things are coming up and what you're interested in. Uh, one person said, a kind of suggestion if, you, if your supervisor uh, still hesitates to allow certain trainings, I think I think going back to the, the slide that I mentioned earlier to really uh, try to, to explain how the training or opportunity will benefit the not only your own skills, but perhaps your team and your agency's mission. And so um, Gabby put up the link for the recording. So the links will be on the digital gov site and the recordings will also be on the seminar YouTube channel as well. So one person said we're incorporating IDPs in our diversity and inclusion plan to support employee development and cognitive diversity training. Fantastic. So one person noted that being short staffed is a challenge to training uh, because of time in training is not time working. And that goes back to the first part of the presentation where we, we talked about ways to bring in people. So there are lots of different ways you can host fellows and interns and bring in people through open opportunities. So if your team is short staffed, there's a, there's a lot of different mechanisms out there to bring in uh, people to help with various roles. So, um, so thank, thank you all for your attention today.